Hey everybody, welcome to Hometown History. I'm Dami. And I'm Jamie. And tonight we're going to be talking about do-it-yourself urbanism, York County style. Yay, and we're at the Blue Sky Tavern, live and in person, so it's not too late to join us at this amazing establishment right down the street where Dami and I okay. live in Edders. Okay, so should we start with the agenda? Yeah, go for it. Okay, so first we're going to talk about the Newberry Town Keystone Markers. Dami's projects. Yeah, that's on me. Then we're going to talk about Jacob Lemon and the Smoketown Cemetery. Then we're going to talk about Jamie's project, which is Project Penny Heaven. And then we're going to talk about uplifting others and working around and about your county. Yep, all these different amazing projects that are happening. So, of course, we have four different takeaways from tonight's presentation. The first is that if you're thinking about do-it-yourself urbanism, you have to seize the opportunity. You can't wait for someone to come along and ask you. Second is that the only way Dami and I were able to be successful is that we established a lot of partnerships and teamwork. So we encourage you to find others to bring along with you. Third is involve the public. People care if they know about it, so you have to do a lot of self-promotion. Mm -hmm. And then finally, uh, the work that Dami and I are doing isn't just going to be a fly by the seat of our pants night work, it is going right. to be long-term investment. Right, so we're gonna start with me. <laughs> All about me Yay. tonight. And this beautiful picture that Jamie took of me. <laughs> Doesn't um, she look nice in her gala outfit? <laughs> we matched that night. Um, so a little bit of background about me is I'm a lifelong resident of Newberry Town, uh, born and raised here, 30 years in Newberry Township. And I've always really been interested in history and Newberry Township as a whole. So anytime that I have the opportunity to do something, the do-it-yourself urbanism aspect and, um, you know, put my mark on Newberry Township. It's something that I want to do. You love Newberry Town. I do, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, everyone that I went to high school with graduated and couldn't get far enough away. <laughs> and I was like, no, I, I live in the house that my grandmother built, Aww. my parents had it, now it's mine. You know, I'm not going anywhere. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Newberry Town's biggest fan. <laughs> yeah. So um, before we had, so think about now, so we were going to talk about Dami and here are Keystone Markers. And they were part of um, PennDOT, right? But before we had PennDOT, we had the Pennsylvania Department of Highways. And after World War I, when this was formed, there was a lot of effort geared towards the good roads movement. Because before this, um, we had horse and buggy, which mm -hmm. used dirt roads, and we had plank roads. But with the good roads movement, there was this federal push to try to improve our transportation systems so that we can use automobiles and use cars. Um, so the markers were installed as a part of that and the keystone markers, here's an example of the one for Cly. They, and this one will be updated eventually, it's on our list. To improve, to paint, repaint. Yeah, because that's technically a Newberry Township. <laughs> oh, I love that. D Dami knows everything, everything Newberry Town. <laughs> I do. Um, so these keystone markers would have been placed at both sides of the town, the entrance and I guess the exit, or the entrance or the exit, depending on your perspective. Mm -hmm. And they would have disclosed the name of the town, the next town, how many miles away it is, as well as usually where it was founded or, or something interesting about it. So here's an example of East Prospect, named from the fine view of the surrounding county, and another one of York, New Salem. Yeah, so when I, started my history page preserving the history of Newberry Town. We were talking about um, different historical aspects of the township and one of them was the keystone markers and someone said hey I haven't seen them since about the 1970s. So I was like hmm I wonder where they're at. So I contacted one of the girls that work at the township and she went back into a storage closet and had one of the guys dig them out and they were back there. So <laughs> From the 70s. Yeah, from the 70s. So that was perfect because we didn't have to recast them, which would have been super expensive mm -hmm. and a really long-term project. So then I contacted the township and said, hey, can I make a public comment at one of your meetings? And I went and I pitched my idea. And this was two years ago. Mm. And I said, you know, I don't want any taxpayer money. I don't want your money. Like I can self fund this. And uh, one of the township supervisors said, no, you know, like I'll put up some money toward it. Wow, nice. And the township will help you. So we worked together. And a little known fact is you have to contact the Keystone Marker Preservation Trust and you have to get specific paint. So the blue and the yellow that you see, it's a very specific type of car paint. Oh, really? Um, yeah. And it lasts through it's leather. Like, it's like Keystone Marker Blue. <laughs> and <laughs> they I have a trademark Yeah, on. and I forget what the color of yellow is. <laughs> but if you don't buy it from them, they'll at least give you the formula. That way you can go to 
I don't Lowe's know. Lowe's or Home Depot. Yeah. They did I not guess, sponsor us. We probably should have said JW. <laughs> Whoever sells car paint <laughs> and they'll mix it up, but it's a very specific color that you have to use. Mm. Uh, we had to sandblast them. We had to get them repainted. So this is a picture of one of the gentlemen at the township that um, did the painting. I don't know. I, I don't think he likes his picture being taken. So this is kind of like an incognito <laughs> shout out to him. Sneaking picture. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, everyone kind of banded together in the township, but it took a solid two years to get it wow. put up. So you worked with the township, you worked with PennDOT, you worked with the trust. Mm -hmm. So one of my questions for you is it sounded like this took a lot of coordination. It like, did. And I think one of the challenges is that people don't really think about um, who to call. So like, right. how did you know who to contact? Right. Well, when I was Googling the Keystone Markers, the first thing that comes up is the Keystone Marker Trust. So that was perfect. And I uh, emailed the two gentlemen that were in the contact information and they were like, this is what you need to do. Contact PennDOT, contact your township. First, you have to find the markers. So we already had those. That was perfect. And then you had to talk to PennDOT about, are they usable? Do they need to be repainted? Do they need to be re-sandblasted? Do I need to make new poles to put them on? You know, and then we had to figure out the coordinates of where to place them. Mm. Because like you said, it's supposed to be at like the start of town and the end of town. So for some people in Newberry Town, they would have said that was Rocket Pizza. Mm -hmm. But now we have one in front of the um, new... Uh, the public safety center public safety complex and then it's going to be in front of the fire hall okay so you know for some people that's not the start you can just dig a hole and, and plan it you actually no. have to figure out where it belongs believe it or not yeah <laughs> so you know and they put in concrete and hopefully it's there for ever many years to come and then the keystone trust takes pictures and they put them on their archived uh, website nice. that way there's apparently there's people that are history nerds like us <laughs> that go around and they take pictures of every keystone marker in the state wow and it's sort of like a rite of passage or like a badge of honor like hey i have discovered that's kind of fun yeah yeah and then that. like ours weren't even on the um website because they were in storage mm -hmm. and no one had a picture of them from the 70s so now they're archived on the website and um when we have the second keystone marker placed, which hopefully within the next year we'll be able to do that, that picture, that updated picture will go on the website as well. It's cool that that's an original. It is, yeah. No, well, okay. So original to the 70s, there is lore in the township that someone ran into it with their car oh. and had to pay to get it recasted. <laughs> okay. And that's why it was put in storage because they're so expensive. I mean, recasting a iron yeah. pack is not cheap. Yeah. So, you know, in 1970s money. Someone tucked it away. Yeah. So they were like, let's just save it in a closet. And then busybody <laughs> me was like, let's dig it out of the closet. <laughs> So another person that is doing amazing work is Jacob mm -hmm. Lemons. So we're going to give a little bit of his background, but stay tuned. He's going to be our extra after Dami and I are finished with our episode. Yeah. So one night I was at the Redland Community Library and a woman came up to me and she said, so I know, you know, Jim McClure and Jamie, and I know you're connected to the newspaper. Can you write a story about Jacob Lemon? And I said, who's Jacob Lemon? <laughs> and she said, he's fixing up a cemetery in Goldsboro entirely by himself. Mm. And I was like, well, I don't write for the newspaper, but I said, maybe I could put something on my history blog. So I found Jacob on Facebook and we ended up talking. And he, again, is another history nerd <laughs> that was like, hey, you know, I have an interest in fixing up this dilapidated cemetery. There was some vandalism over mm. time. Um, a lot of these headstones were buried in the ground. They were so dirty that you couldn't read the names. So through his own ingenuity and through financing it largely by himself, he was able to single-handedly fix this entire cemetery. And he's still working on it. And he has a great website and Instagram, and he started to go fund me. Um, so if you want to support him, please look him up and, you know, get involved. Yeah, here's his Instagram page. He also has a YouTube video um, because we're going to ask him here in a few minutes. But, um, uh, you know, according to Dami and him, someone had gone into the cemetery and they started working on his ancestors' old tombs. And he said he was nervous that maybe it wasn't done exactly like it should have been done. Because if you don't take care of stones properly, they become um, brittle or um, they wear down and just erode. So thankfully, the person that worked on it did it correctly, but that fear kind of inspired and motivated him to then say, I'm going to create a YouTube video to teach others on how to fix cemetery stones. And it's also kind of a lesson that we learned about Jacob because takeaway number three, he involved the public, he is posting videos and creating content for the rest of us to learn from him. Yeah, and I just want to make a note. Um, you'll see people like this and you might be inspired to go in and clean up 
cemeteries, please get permission from the owner of the cemetery, <laughs> number one, and don't work on any stones that aren't your ancestor stones without permission. Because there mm. are people that have great intentions, but they use the wrong chemical or the wrong process and they end up damaging the stone forever. Yeah. And that's a very expensive thing to fix. Yeah. And you don't want to get on the wrong side of a cemetery owner. <laughs> um, you know, they might charge you for yeah. that headstone or the family could charge you for the headstone. So just do your research, make sure you're doing it right. Contact people like Jacob who have the resources to be able to tell you what to use in the right way to do yeah. it. You're kind of a buzzkill when you say that, I but know. there are rules behind things. <laughs> I know. Cemeteries <laughs> seem like, oh yeah, like anyone can go in and you can, but not anyone can just start, you know, So speaking of stones. cemeteries and just starting to dig up different stuff, um, we're going to briefly go over Project Penny Heaven and my do-it-yourself urbanism. Yeah. So York City Cemetery now has a memorial monument, thanks to Jamie right here. And, and it team. honors more than 800 people that were buried there in unmarked graves. So like all community, uh, York isn't immune to the challenges of poverty and people struggle with food insecurity, unstable housing, alcohol and drug abuse and dysfunctional families. And while there are many organizations working to support those facing the hardships like the food bank, treatment centers and shelters speckled around the community, no support exists when the people die. Yeah. So um, this was a potter's field. It is a um, one acre plot that is located in North York, but it is owned and managed by York City. Um, and, and it just kind of spoke to me that the people that were buried here were, were the have nots. They didn't really have any money. They didn't have family either that were willing to financially pay for them to have a plot. And so it really inspired me to put a monument in because they were, they were faceless, right? But they were nameless. And there was just one stone that was there and it just kind of broke my heart. So um, personally, I just felt motivated to help these people. It kind of resonated with them. So I formed the Friends of York City Cemetery. This is this committee to try to raise money to put in this monument. Mm -hmm. And we uncovered a lot of stories of the people that were buried here, which is which is critical to doing history, right? Yeah. And, you know, out of those 800 people, we could probably pick anyone. But right. tonight we picked Squire Braxton. Um, so his actual name is Charles Granger, and he was born into slavery, and he moved to York in May of 1827. And that was when two Conestoga wagons were rumbling into West York. And as a freedman, he could now select his home, and he could chose to settle right here in York County. Yeah. He built a shack in Penn Park. It was made out of old wood and boards and tin. And a lot of the neighborhood kids would come and bother him by throwing stones at his shanty. And he had a lot of dogs and they would bark at him. Um, so he also, to make money, he really lived off the trash of others. So he would pick up trash, he would pick up manure and then sell it to farmers. Um, he would dig out privies for people. So, I mean, he was born into slavery, chose to settle down in York and made a name for himself and a home for himself here at Penn Park. Right. And when Skyer Braxton ended up dying in 1881, hundreds of people attended his funeral. So that goes to show you how well known he was in the community. And the funeral that took place in the previous location of York's Potter Field, located across from Penn Park along South Beaver Street and West College Avenue. It was moved to New North York in 1897 when William Penn built a new school. Yeah. So Squire Braxton spent the last two years of his life in an alms house. He didn't have anything to his name, but he had lots of friends and family. But he had no one to pay for his burial plot. So that's why he was placed in City Cemetery. Um, according to the newspapers, they did. there was a, a marker there, but it was wooden cross. And as we know, those things decay over time. And so he would have been lost to history. Um, which is really sad and one of the reasons why we wanted to put in a monument. It is sad and he's just one of the 800 people that are buried there and there's literally hundreds of other stories just like this one. Ones of loss, hardship and loneliness as well as those overcoming the setbacks that are thrown at them. And this is what prompted Jamie to spend two and a half years on the project. Yeah, and it just, so it just kind of happened by happenstance. I wasn't planning on moving to this apartment in downtown York, uh, North York technically, but one of my bedroom windows looked over Prospect Hill and then my other bedroom window looked over this. And this is City Cemetery and this is what I saw. And it wasn't until one day I went for a walk and I saw that stone, those are my feet. And I was like, oh, this is a cemetery. So I went online, found an article written by the amazing Jim McClure and I had my own blog. So I thought I'm gonna write a story about it. 
I presented at a conference, the American uh, Pennsylvania Association of Greenstone Studies. The mayor happened to be there, mm -hmm. and he's Mayor Helfrich of York. And he said, Jamie, I'm a, I'm a historian. I didn't even know this was here. There should be a monument. I'm like, I know, right? And he went, you should do that. So I don't know if he actually clicked. Maybe if he's watching this, I don't remember if you actually clicked or not. But in my comment, head, in the comment yeah, section, in my head, it was like you're a cheerleader already for me in the very beginning. Um, and that was the beginning of this this project. So you know, one of our um, first takeaways for you is to seize an opportunity. This was something that no one necessarily asked me to do. I just kind of found myself in this space. Right, and like Janie said, no one asked her to do this. Neither of us answered an ad in the newspaper that said. <laughs> hey, uh, revitalize the keystone markers. Hey, put in a monument to a potter's cemetery. Yeah. You know, so these are things that, you know, we saw something that needed to be done. We saw a gap and we wanted to fill those. And we knew that we had to contact other people to help us, that it wasn't something we could do on our own and yep. we needed to involve the community. Yep. And these weren't though like super premeditated. It wasn't like one day we woke up and we were like, do you know what I really want to do is find a cemetery and build a monument. Like that's not how it happened. Mm -hmm. So it's a combination of, of looking for opportunity, um, but then just keeping an eye out. Right. And we're also not doing it for the glory. Um, my name is not on the keystone marker. I'm not one of the founding fathers of Newberry town, <laughs> even though I pretend to be. Um, and Jamie's name isn't on the monument. Mm -hmm. So, you know, of course we advertise these things and we have no problem sharing and talking about it, but who knows in 10, 20 years, if people will remember who did the project, yeah. but we're just happy that we had a chance to be involved and, you know, it's going to be there for generations to come, whether our names are on it or not. Yeah. And, and don't get us wrong. The accolades feel good. Like yes. right now it feels good talking about this. And, mm -hmm. and when newspapers came out and like when the news um, caught it, but yeah. like Dami said, in 20 years, like our names are, are on there. So unless some cool local history teacher gets kids to dig through the archives and find our names, we probably won't be there. Right. Um, yeah. So it really boils down to finding something you care about and acting. Um, like I said, for me, my family, um, we're, we're doing great, but we definitely come from modest backgrounds. And so I have a personal connection to people who are living in lower income situations and have to frankly work hard, like working class folks who otherwise, um, you know, they don't have a life of luxury and just have to work. Mm -hmm. And also I taught at Milton Hershey School for 10 years. That's a school for lower income kids. And the idea is to get them out of poverty. And those were, um, they're, they are amazing kids. Like I still am very connected to a lot of them. And just because their family doesn't have money doesn't mean they don't matter. And so when I think about the families that are buried in Potter's Field, like they could have, they could have been my family, mm -hmm. you know? And so I just felt a very personal connection. Right. And then you also have to think about things that inspire you. So Jamie was inspired for Penny Heaven and I was inspired to do the Keystone Markers because I've lived here for 30 years. And just in those years, I've seen how much the town has changed and we're really modernizing. We have a Dunkin' Donuts now. The highway goes right through town. Um, we have two auto parts stores, a Walmart. And, you know, 20 years ago, even 15 years ago, we didn't have any of those. Um, it was a big deal when the Super Rudders came to town. <laughs> So, Are there um, technically two or the one in Strystown is out of the yeah, out that's, of Newberry yeah, Town? Yeah, that's Strystown, the village of Strystown. <laughs> um, so, you know, having those keystone markers is a call back to the history of our town. And when you drive through, you're going to see that. You're going to see what year we were founded. You're going to understand why it's called Newberry Town. And, you know, it's just a part of history that I don't want us to lose. I'm really happy about um, the modernization and the development of our town. I think that's great. We're moving forward, but I'd always want us to remember our history. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. So these projects, if, if tonight inspires you to start doing something, even if it's small, um, be prepared. They take a lot of time, but they are worth it. Um, the, the conference that I presented at where I first spoke to the mayor was in the fall of 2021. And it wasn't until this past spring that the monument went in. So what you see is me and the monument, but what you don't see are the hours of time discussing what will the monument look like? What position will it be? How high will it be? Going around and going to the different monument stone, like companies, funeral homes, mm -hmm. and pricing them out. Shout out to Sill Balls because they gave me a 50% discount on that headstone. And that was just philanthropy, right? Yeah. That was just someone giving. You don't see the hours of time researching in the archives, reading books, talking to people, writing stories, fundraising. Like we did our own PR and it just took so much time and you don't really see that behind 
behind the scenes. So we, I hear it now I'm a buzzkill. But if you're going to launch into the launch into these projects, like you you have to really sit down with yourself and ask yourself, is this a, a multi year commitment that I'm willing to, to take on? Right. Because when I first presented, I thought, OK, here's a sign. All I have to do is get it placed in the ground. Easy, right? <laughs> Two years later, I found out <laughs> not so easy. You know, it had to be done on township time. It had to be on township property. So we had to have permission on where to put it. You know, there's a lot of red tape involved mm -hmm. and you have to go through the right channels. Like I said before, you had to use specific paint. I thought, hey, I'm going to paint it blue. No, <laughs> it's not that easy. You can't, just take, yeah, you can't just take an old cast iron um, plaque and paint over it. We had to sandblast it. Mm -hmm. I don't have a sandblaster in my garage. <laughs> you know, so there, they, it had to go through the right channels to be done. So two years is a lot of time for a plaque to be reinstalled, a marker to be reinstalled, but it was so worth it. Yeah. And it felt so good. And it was funny because all of the guys from the township that helped, they took their picture with me at the end and yeah. they were all shy. Like, I don't want my picture taken. And I'm like, no, you. Hey, wait, let me go back to it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I told them, I was like, you're going to be in the newspaper. <laughs> Um, and that kind of is another big takeaway is that we couldn't do this without the community. When we installed flowers at Penny Heaven, um, Pheasant Run Greenhouse donated a lot of the flowers and also the equipment and the time to install them. And that's just mm -hmm. the generosity of um, Jeff Lowe with the organization down in Glenrock area. Bob Mann there with his family, who's going to be our extra here in a few minutes. Um, my own family and friends. I feel kind of bad for them. I drag them along. <laughs> Jamie's always like, want to do something fun? Let's go clean up the cemetery. <laughs> but they agree, which is great. Yes. Yeah. And like we said before, we're not doing it for the glory, but it feels good because Jamie was nominated for an Eight Who Cares Award. So when you're doing things for your community, it's always nice when the community says thank yeah, you. Yeah, it does mean a lot. So WJL8 every year has an award, the Eight Who Cares Award, and nine or eight people, I'm sorry, are nominated through just public yeah, yeah people are saying hey i've heard about this project and i think it needs to be recognized you got a spot on the news it gave you great publicity you got a nice little award at the end yeah and it was your nice. family and friends i got to be there and it was great and you know anyone can be nominated and it was bob who nominated me so Thank you, bob. <laughs> yeah. bob's great yeah and you know it's nice because it's it's your own friends and family that are really you know the support and the push behind yeah. you and it's nice when you know the local news is like hey we think this is worthy of recognition yeah so we just have a, a couple more takeaways um, because we're hoping this inspires some people. Um, one is, again, I hate, I hate to be this buzzkill, um, but it takes planning, preparation, organization, uh, and also a word of caution about handling money. If you are going to accept money from the public for an enterprise like this, um, you cannot accept money in your own name or else it becomes a liability. So I encourage you to get what's called a fiscal sponsorship. So you can form your own nonprofit, which takes a lot of time to develop a 501c3, worthwhile, but takes time. So instead, I got Preservation in Pennsylvania to be my fiscal sponsor, which basically means that I sign a paper with them. They agree for me to be under their financial umbrella. They handle all of my cash in, all of my cash out, and then I don't have to be involved in that. Um, so the, the reason why I got hooked up with Pennsylvania Preserva Preservation PA was because they were working on historically black cemeteries, mm -hmm. and Penny Heaven is about 41% black of the known names, let alone all the other names. So uh, it is difficult to find a fiscal sponsor, but it's worth it. Yeah, and as far as me working with Newberry Township, we formed a committee so that we didn't have to form the nonprofit. So it's under the umbrella of the township. They can handle our money, but it's not taxpayer money. You know, it's all self-funded sponsorship sort of thing. Good. Yeah. I'm glad you didn't use my money. I, I really like to plug that I don't use taxpayer <laughs> money. You heard it so here the first. The comments below. Please make sure you correct all the people in the comments below. I know. <laughs> So takeaway number two is work as a team. Um, from the very beginning, the township has been super generous and helpful. I work with the supervisors, um, Diane Schellenhammer, who's here tonight. Thank you, because she's like my biggest supporter. And we really bounce a lot of ideas off of each other. And after working on the Keystone Markers, we decided to take on some other historic projects around Newburytown. So I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, but it really matters that you have a good team behind mm -hmm. you and you're not just doing everything yourself. 
Um, you might have a great idea, but you need to bounce those ideas off of other people to see if number one, it's feasible. Mm -hmm. And number two, if it's something that's going to be well received, you know, here I am, I was really invested in the keystone markers. There's plenty of people out there that don't care about keystone markers. They could care less if they are installed or not. No, I know everyone loves that. I know, but you know, and it was just nice to have people that said, okay, yes, this is something we can do and we're willing to help you you know, achieve that goal. Yep. So, yep. Well, and that kind of is, is another thing to think about as well is that, so I, I made a mistake when we first created Hometown History, our third episode was how we take care of the loved and the unloved mm -hmm. and included Potter's Field before I did any of this research to raise money for a city cemetery. And we had a member of the community who reached out and said, mm -hmm hey, my grandfather's buried there. It's not that we didn't love him. We had no money. And so for you to say it's the unloved, it, you know, it makes me feel some type of way. So I appreciated that he reached out and first off felt comfortable enough to talk to us in a way that was relationship building instead of mm -hmm. just blasting us because then we responded by changing the name and now I don't use that term anymore. So it is important to think about your projects and how, who does it impact? Kind of like what Dami was saying with Jake and mm -hmm. the cemetery and yes. thinking about the actual ancestors that are alive in the area. Yeah, and you can't go into it with an ego. You you have to be able to take constructive criticism and advice yeah. from other people because you could have easily said, hey, you know, that's the title I chose and that's how I view it. But you were willing to open up and say, oh, OK, I made a mistake. And and that's again, Jim and Dami, yeah. we bounce we bounce things off of one another. Yeah. So here are a bunch of other projects. Yeah, because it's not just Jamie and I. There's a ton of historians and community leaders that are working on different projects. We want to highlight Red Lion Roars, and that's a nonprofit that helps Red Lion by supporting festivals, music events, recreation, and arts projects. And the goal is to bring more culture to the community and promote downtown. It's completely run by volunteers and driven by people who live and care about the Red Lion area. Yay, go Red Lion. Yes. Next, we're going to move up to York City. This is Yoko and Robert Anamoto, and they were tired of this garden that was at the corner of South Penn and West College. It was dilapidated and it kind of symbolized decay and crime in the area, even though lots of lovely people live just right down the road. So they took it upon themselves to build and continue to main this beautiful garden that really is a, is a beautiful oasis right in the, mm -hmm. uh, on South Penn Street. Yeah, it's beautiful. And then we have Bob Mann, who again will be with us in our interview segment coming up, but he has work at Farquhar Park and he continuously places fresh flowers at the interpretive plaques of the memorial for Lily Bell Allen and Henry C. Shad. And those are two individuals that were killed in the 1969 race riots. But he's done so much more than that and he'll be sharing that during our extra because, I mean, we could talk to him for hours yeah. <laughs> about his work. Um, next, we have the Fallen Firefighters Memorial. This mm -hmm. is on Broad Street and was kickstarted by York XL. I used to be on their board, but the committee is all full of volunteers and it remembers two firefighters that lost their lives there on Broad Street. And so there was a lot of time and effort led by Sal Galdamez to install another monument, and more gardens to remember these fallen heroes. And I don't want to ruin her name, Annalisa um, Gojmarek. Gojameric. Annalisa Gojameric's gardens. Um, she's a ball of energy and this woman, <laughs> she uses that energy to bring beauty to York. She noticed overgrown plots that were all around York, so she worked with local owners and funders to install fish ponds, bee houses, murals, seating, compost, trees, flowers, and vegetables that she donated to local organizations. Many of her gardens are on the site of collapsed buildings, so those could have just sat you know, mm -hmm. in disrepair, but she decided to make it something beautiful. And you have to remember our fourth takeaway, sometimes these projects require upkeep, so it's not just a one and done. Oh. For example, Annalisa had to call Tom Landis from York City, and he hauls off illegal dumping like couches and garbage at these abandoned sites, as well as Belinda Nace of York City RDA, who helps with her abandoned vehicles. And it takes a lot of work, but Annalise is willing to show up every day and get these projects done. Yeah. We would be remiss if we didn't talk about Sam Dorm and her team at the yeah. Friends of Lebanon Cemetery yes. up in North York, um, historically black cemetery, mm -hmm. and the amount of people that they have mobilized to continue to take care of these stones and also tell these people stories. Um, she's really an inspir inspiration for, um, for me, for sure, with Potter's Field. Yeah, Sam's amazing. 
And next we have Matthew Jackson with the Heart of Hanover Walking Trails. So Hanover has a rich history and Matt Jackson thought it should be told to the visitors that come to Hanover. So he believed wayside markers would be the medium to tell that story to the tourists. And the Heart of Hanover Trails initiative was conceived and the project tells Hanover's history to the world. The markers are posted online at witnessingyork.com so you can view them online or in person Yay. in Hanover. And uh, last but not least, we've got Corey Wolf. He is a local resident in York of York, and he was tired of kind of abandoned places, not looking very pretty, frankly. So he was able to get a group of people together and, and paint um, old storefronts or dilapidated signs. So this is the AAA building that's on Market Street. Here was another old sign that a group of people have tagged, and he took it upon himself to just paint it. And he, though, knows a lot of people in the city, and he talks to a lot of people, too. It's not like he just randomly shows up and starts painting. And he's a talented <laughs> painter, which helps. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I'm not done yet. So I installed one keystone marker, but we're still working on the second one. It needs sandblasted and repainted, but it's going to go in front of the Newberry Town Fire Hall, which I'm really excited about that. And the township is still working with me and supporting this project and the community supporting me. So kudos to them for being so enthusiastic about the project. And then um, I alluded to the fact that I'm also working with the township on other projects. So we formed a committee, the Newberry Township or Newberry Town Special Events Committee. And we're going to put in a community tree. So it's going to be our community Christmas tree. We're gonna have a Christmas tree lighting in November. And we're also going to have a veterans memorial. So we partnered with the VFW in Edders, and we're going to have a memorial put in. It's a plaque that honors all of the veterans of Newburytown, past and present, and we're going to sell memorial bricks. So if you have a veteran that um, either was born or lived in Newberry Township, resided here, you can buy a brick and it will honor your loved one. We have three lines that you can put 18 characters across each line. Um, I'm going to buy one for my grandpa. Both of my third great grandfathers were veterans wow. in the Civil War. I mean, we go all the way back to the Revolutionary War here in Newberry Township. And a lot of them are buried in Paddletown Cemetery or Castle Cemetery. Um, so it's just a really great way for people to leave their mark on Newberry Township. It's something that will always be there. Um, so we're really looking forward to that. And again, the township, we have police officers on the committee, just community members. Um, we have township supervisors on the community committee and myself, and we're all working together to make this happen. And we're going to have a Veterans Day ceremony. Um, Jim agreed to speak, Scott Mingus <laughs> is gonna be there, the VFW is gonna talk, um, my Civil War reenacting group is gonna act as the color guard, uh, we're gonna do um, a gun salute, we're gonna play taps, and it's gonna be really nice. And it's just a way for the community to come out, see those bricks placed, see the tree. And then in November, we're gonna have the tree lighting, we're gonna have music and hot chocolate and food trucks. And it's just gonna be a really great way for the community to come together for something positive. Girl, I love you. Thank like, you. you're so cool. I'm, fa I'm fangirling so hard right now. Well, I'm your resident in Newburytown, so you're coming. I, oh yeah, I will absolutely be there. Definitely, even if I move, I would, not that, I, that's not happening anytime in the future, but. Her husband's yeah. grinning. <laughs> um, so now that we're wrapping up here, we want to remind you of our, of our takeaways. And one is to seize an opportunity. If you see a gap in society or our community, you know, try filling it. Yes. Um, we need you as grassroots organizations. Second is partner, find who you can bring along the way, who can you lean on when you need them. Um, a lot of people think about giving back as just um, treasure, right? Just giving your money, but you can also give your time and you can give your talent. So with time, it's just a matter of showing up and putting mm -hmm. in the work, but then talent is also, if you're a good writer and you wanna reach out to an organization and help them write stories, or if you're a photographer and show up and take people's pictures, you've got lots of skills and we absolutely need you in the community. And it can be as simple as just bringing something to the township's attention or a community yeah. leader's attention. If you notice something, say something, and maybe there's someone out there that has the talent and the resources to fix it. Yeah, combine it, yep. Um, third, involve the public, inform people. Um, I know it sounds kind of self-grandiose to be like, look, 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 but that's the only way people are gonna notice. Like you have to self-promote and you have to just share and share and share as much as you possibly can. And, and also people wanna know, if, and if they don't know about it, then how can they help? Right. And then finally, um, depending on your project, the keystone markers probably won't take a lot of maintenance, would you say? No, if anything, I think maybe every few years, 
like power wash them. Yeah, yeah. But depending on your project, it, it might require a little bit of time and upbeat because, um, frankly, hoping we can have succession planning and people can yeah. come after you, but you're the one who's going to care for it. So yeah, because uh, at Penny Heaven, around your monument, you planted flowers, so those yeah. need to be watered. They need, I need to, be to go pruned. weed actually. Yeah. yeah. See, there you go. <laughs> I need to so go weed. yeah, there's upkeep. You know, you have to weed whack every yep. once in a while. Yep. So our next episode. Yeah, so please join us again on September 26th in person at Peter Botris' new location for his music initiatives in New York, Continental Square. Hometown History will take you through the history of that square, sharing some of our most important stories like Continental Congress to Black Lives Matter protests. And we'll tie this into York's 275th and other major league anniversaries coming up in 2026 and 2027. So we can't wait to see you there on Facebook Live. And is that an in-person one? Yep, in person. Yep. So come on down to York's Time Now Square. And it's the day before my birthday. Yeah, so, you so should all come out and celebrate my birthday. birthday. Why wouldn't you want to? <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you. <laughs>